Hello and welcome to the spring break version of AP Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about Unit 10, Liquids and Solids. This is mostly review with a couple new things, but hopefully you'll be a little bit more ready for the AP exam in a few short weeks. Um, make sure you follow along in your notes, fill in the blanks, and you will get credit for this when you come back. Here's everything we're going to cover as usual. Looks like a lot, but much of it's review. So let's start out at the beginning. All right, intramolecular bonding. The prefix intra tells us that we are talking about bonds, not intermolecular forces, which we've talked about before. So if there's an intramolecular bond, something is sharing electrons. What kind of bond shares electrons? Recall that that's a covalent bond between two nonmetals. So which would be stronger, intramolecular bonding or intermolecular forces? Remember, a bond is always stronger than a force. So intramolecular bonding is what actually holds these atoms together within the molecule. It's actually what makes the hydrogen and the oxygen stick together in water versus just a force of attraction. On the other hand, we have intermolecular forces sometimes abbreviated as IM forces. These are weaker attractions that occur between molecules, and you already know these three types. We have our dipole-dipole forces, our hydrogen bonding, and our London dispersion forces. Remember, there are two that fall under London dispersion, but both of them deal with electrons. Like I said before, intramolecular bonds are stronger than intermolecular forces. So bonds are stronger than forces. Let's talk about an example here. We have a bunch of water molecules. The dots in between the hydrogen and oxygen do not represent bonds. Those represent hydrogen bonding, which is so confusing because it says bond, but remember that's an intermolecular force. So the blue dotted lines represent that and the solid white lines represent the actual covalent bonding. Now when we change state, we have to try and overcome these forces. That doesn't mean we made a chemical change because we didn't break any bonds. So when we melt something, we have to overcome forces, but we don't have to break bonds. That's review, we should remember that. So when we talk about phase changes, our molecules always remain intact. So when we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, it's still water. If it was water, oxygen, nitrogen, doesn't matter, it's still the same thing that it was. This has to do with forces, not changes within the bonding. So keep that in mind. This is definitely review our three states of matter. Gases have high kinetic energy, they move fast, Liquids have a little bit less kinetic energy, but they still move a little bit, and our solids have very small amount of kinetic energy, but they do vibrate. So if this was an even better diagram, it would actually show the movement of these molecules. And remember, everything's always moving. So in a gas, oh, it went backwards. In a solid, they have fixed positions. In a liquid, they flow past each other. And in a gas, they move independently of one another. How about when we have a phase change? When we go from a solid to a liquid, the particles in those fixed position start to vibrate more, and they eventually overcome these forces that we talked about and change into a liquid. Keep in mind your phase diagram. In order to get to that plateau where we are turning our whole ice cube into a liquid, every little teeny bit of energy that's added in is helping to overcome those forces. How about from a liquid to a gas? Same sort of process. We continue adding energy, eventually reaching that gaseous state, and they move a little bit further apart. So what would have stronger intermolecular forces? A solid going to a liquid or a liquid going to a gas? Definitely a solid to a liquid because we have more tightly packed particles that are moving less quickly. Okay, so the strength of our forces determines the temperature at which these phase changes will occur. And we just talked about this when we talked about our colligative properties, so we're backtracking a little bit. Our highest melting point is going to be something with a lot of these intermolecular forces. Our lowest melting point will have less intermolecular forces. 
Now how about dipole-dipole forces? Remember, a dipole is something that uh, is polar. If we have a dipole moment, it's because these polar bonds create an electric field. They kind of act like an ionic compound, when in reality, they're still covalent. So molecules with these dipole moments can attract to each other and line up. Remember when I showed you the two charged plates? and our polar molecules lined up. That's what we're talking about here. They're going to be attracted to each other, but they're actually really weak. They're 1% as strong as covalent or ionic bonds. So really, really weak in comparison to our intramolecular forces. And then we Bonds have between do. atoms with different electronegativities have a permanent dipole, that is, a separation of charges, because of the unequal sharing of electrons. Some molecules which contain polar bonds do not have a net dipole. For example, carbon tetrachloride has polar carbon chloride bonds, but the polarities cancel as a result of its symmetrical structure. It is therefore a nonpolar molecule. Even though the chloroform molecule has a tetrahedral shape, one of the outer atoms is different from the others, so the molecule is not symmetrical. This means the bond dipoles do not cancel, and the molecule has an overall dipole moment. It is polar. Molecules such as sulfur dioxide have asymmetrical structures due to one or more unshared pairs of electrons on the central atom. Keep in mind here that they're not showing us our unshared pair of electrons, but if we drew out sulfur dioxide, you would have two unshared pairs up here on the top, giving us this Vesper shape. If you recall what this Vesper shape is, we have a bent molecule, and because it's asymmetrical, that's going to make it polar. So you don't even have to think about electronegativity. You should be able to draw your Lewis dot structure and determine if something's polar or nonpolar, if it will have dipole forces or not. Sulfur dioxide is an asymmetrical molecule with polar bonds. Therefore, it is a polar molecule. When polar molecules, such as sulfur dioxide, are close to one another, they tend to align so that the positive end of one molecule points towards the negative end of another molecule. Attractions among polar molecules are called dipole-dipole forces. Okay, so the whole point there was these forces occur only between polar molecules. If you have something that's polar mixed with something that's nonpolar, this isn't going to occur. But if we have a bunch of polar molecules hanging out, this will be yet another force we have to overcome. So what will have a higher boiling and melting point? Something that's ionic, something that's polar, or something that's nonpolar. If we rank them in order, our ionic bond will have the highest melting point because they literally have different charges. Our polar will be next because they're acting like they have different charges and our nonpolar will be last because they have no attraction to one another. They're happy being lonely and hanging out alone. Back to hydrogen bonding for just a second. Technically, hydrogen bonding is an incredibly strong dipole-dipole force. And what happens is hydrogen is stuck to something really electronegative, so something near fluorine. And a little abbreviation you can use to remember it is NOF. If it's nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, chances are there's going to be hydrogen bonding. It's very strong because of this electronegativity difference and because hydrogen is so small, he wants to hang out with someone who will balance out his charge. So substances with hydrogen bonding have a higher melting and boiling point than regular dipole-dipole forces. We already know that because we know hydrogen bonding is the strongest force. Okay, sorry I had a little interruption there. Let me find my place. We were talking about hydrogen bonding. So this hydrogen bonding will cause higher melting and boiling points than molecules with regular dipole-dipole forces. I just mentioned that. How about a video? Some polar molecules have unusually strong intermolecular attractions called hydrogen bonding. These attractions occur in molecules where hydrogen is bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. The interaction occurs between the hydrogen of one molecule and an unshared electron pair on the more electronegative element in another molecule. 
The orientation of hydrogen fluoride and water molecules in the liquid states of these substances is determined by hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen atom in hydrogen fluoride is attracted to the fluorine atom on another hydrogen fluoride molecule. Water with two hydrogen atoms and two unshared pairs of electrons can form four hydrogen bonds per molecule. In ice, hydrogen bonding leads to a tetrahedral arrangement of water molecules around one another, forming six membered rings that leave open channels through the ice structure. In liquid water, the tetrahedral arrangement is not fixed because the molecules are able to move around, and on average, a water molecule is surrounded by 3.4 other water molecules. Hydrogen bonding forces are unusually strong attractions that occur among molecules in which hydrogen is bonded to a highly electronegative atom. Okay, so moving on to London dispersion forces. This is the only intermolecular force that will occur in nonpolar molecules and noble gases. Why is that? Because they all have electrons. So the others were only good for polar molecules. But these guys can occur on anyone. And that's because those electrons are constantly moving. And if for a moment they're not distributed symmetrically, it can cause this temporary charge. Because this charge is so small, one little electron or two, and doesn't last for very long, it's really weak. But it can be significant in really large molecules. So if we put together anyone that's a halogen with itself, it would be a really large molecule that's nonpolar because equally balanced electrons. But those electrons can really cause a London dispersion force. What we call the ability to undergo that force is polarizability. It's the ease with which we can distort that electron cloud. It can occur in all of them, like I said before, including nonpolar molecules. In solid carbon dioxide, dry ice, nonpolar molecules are arranged close to one another in a regular array where they move slightly around an average position. The distribution of electrons in a molecule can occasionally become asymmetrical leading to the formation of a temporary separation of charges, a dipole. Partial changes on the molecule that form a temporary dipole then influence the electron clouds of nearby molecules. Although the dipoles are temporary, there is a significant attractive force between adjacent molecules as a result of the deformation of their electron clouds. These attractive forces are called London dispersion forces. London dispersion forces are the only type of intermolecular force found in nonpolar molecules. Okay, so how does this affect my melting and boiling point? In general, the stronger intermolecular force, the higher the melting and boiling point, which makes complete sense because they have extra attraction going on inside. As we know, hydrogen's the strongest, it's not actually a bond. Dipole, dipoles next, and then we have our London dispersion forces, which in the past we have called electron dispersion and van der Waals. Here's just a little graph that's showing us some of the boiling points and how they change. Notice how high water is compared to other um, covalent compounds. That's because of those electrons, that hydrogen bonding, almost everyone who would have lone pairs plus hydrogen end up pretty high on the chart. It has to all do with that polarization of a molecule and the electron distribution. Then look down here, CH4. He has these four hydrogens coming off of him equally spaced, really low boiling point because he's not polar. So let's do a little concept check here. Which molecule would form stronger intermolecular forces? Think about that, and I'll show you the answer in the next video.